And now, another exciting episode in the adventures of Outdoor Journal Radio. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to the program, Outdoor Journal Radio. I am uh, Angelo Viola. He is Peter Bowman, Volva, Nick, and Dean. Kind of in that order. Well, uh, well. I don't know. You're an invisible <laughs> Nick again is what you're introducing there, but that's good. Uh, I, like I that. have a contract with him. I have to oh, do that. Or oh, I'll be now the truth is coming out. I got you. I got you. Speaking of uh, legalities, cool. I have not heard back. I was expecting to hear something back uh, from the folks at... Uh, WestJet or Ooh. Air Canada or uh, Porter. Are you kidding me? You're After my last you are rant. expecting something back from them? You know what? Foolishly, I th- thought maybe you that know, somebody you know. would tell somebody who would tell somebody who would tell somebody that Angelo was not a happy camper yeah, with the Maybe if they knew service. who you were. Maybe you should well, emphasize the outdoor I, journal. I'm hoping. I hope. Like I aspire one day to for that to happen, but. You want me to um, send him a nasty one? I sent a nasty Napanese one. To, I sent one that I was embarrassed to send <laughs> to Air Canada. God, not like not on this incident. I would love you to read that over the oh, airwaves. Oh, I couldn't. Here. I couldn't. Uh, I, I, I sent it uh, about a year ago. Oh, and, okay. uh, That was when we got back from ICAST. Could have been. It was. And it, you said it was like you had to go through like an 80-page survey or something yeah. just to do it. Yeah. They make it very hard. Yeah. And you would think that one person, one person would have said, holy shit, man. Like, this guy, Boy, we is need this to. this guy pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> like, we need to get a hold of him God. and find out yeah, what's yeah. going on. But you, they probably get those every day. When I mean, you think about it, the way they're treating people, that might be a common occurrence for these people. So, these companies. Hmm? Who knows? I, I know. Right? You, you're one of many. I'm still beside myself how that could happen. Oh, you're beside me. Well, and and who's Thanks beside me. myself? <laughs> True. Okay. Bounce so back. It's a double, it's a double By the way, uh, this moment. might be the first time that Mr. Bowman and I obviously look like we came out of the same dressing room. We both have hoodies on. I don't see much of the gray on my, the, the two-tone on my. It looks black, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, is that the camera operator that maybe I is not? I don't think maybe so. It'll be fixed in post. I'm sorry? It'll be fixed in post. Yeah, oh, it'll be fixed in post. Because the camera is for sure has got the good deal going on. But it we're does. looking through a shitty oh. little monitor. Maybe that's what it is. So, so. it's not the cameraman with the nice settings. This is a nice two-tone here. This is a nice light gray, lighter gray, black here. Uh, Looks wonderful. He's got, the, he's got the gray on yeah. complete there. They both look black. They both, they? yeah, yeah. Oh well, we've lost a lot of detail in us, buddy. Yeah, over the years. Story of my life. Yes, yeah, sir. However, we do have a wonderful program to share with you. Well, you, you didn't tell them to, that they can buy these at shop. Well, I thought that com. maybe you would do that automatically, and you. Well, did, you, you cut me off. I was just about oh, to do it. Right. If you go to shop.fishingcanada.com, you too can buy these. Uh, hopefully, you'll see the proper embroidered, colors. Colored, embroidered, 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 by the way. Embroidered logo it just feels so Hand nice. Hand uh, embroidered yes. by young maidens, I'm told. <laughs> That's what I'm told. Uh, I could be wrong, but oh well, I'm gonna buy a couple more of them. Then somebody I to told definitely. me that. Got to keep the but young beautiful em- working. Beautiful embroidery. Yep, is the best Absolutely. part. I mean, uh, they do feel great. The, the, these the, are comfy. The I hand. have to say, we're, 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 we're hamming it up here, folks. But these things are comfy as hell. The hand they really is are wonderful. nice. Yeah, yep. the embroidery is just a bonus. That'll last forever, right? I would think so, as opposed to silk screen. Although we do have those available too at a much uh, lower price for those. Uh, can we just address this for a moment? <laughs> I, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> Good, go, go. I, I, I noticed uh, recently that we received some of our surveys, some of our surveys yeah. that we've asked folks about what they think of the uh, store and the merch that we've got in there. And I noticed a couple of them were saying that, you know, what they didn't like was the prices were too high. Like your nuts are too high. Remember that one? <laughs> Remember that joke? Oh huh? my God, do I remember that joke? That was a good one. Alex and Yeti. I'll remember the guy that told me that joke. Alex and Yeti. Alex oh and Yeti on, uh, on one of my construction sites. And he told me that joke and I died laughing. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, anyways, uh, I noticed that we have a couple of uh, people saying that the prices are too high. And uh, my question to those folks is that are you looking you know at the lower price versions because we have this these two wonderful garments available with a silk screen logo on and while we do in that one yeah i don't know about this one but we do in that one we have it silk screen and that is considerably 
It's not the same quality as this, but you can get it for, I think, half the price of that. Right. And so. their logo pops up. Oh, and it really my looks God. Good. That silk beautiful. screen is the one thing about silk screen, it really shows up nice. Oh, my right? God. It's and they do beautiful. a good job of it. So, yeah. So, I, I'm just saying, you know, maybe you yeah. need to. As my uh, uh, old woodshop, grade nine woodshop school teacher, Alvin Hiltz, used to say, Viola, read all the pages in the book. So, in this case, look at all the pages in the catalog there on. I think Viola Shop. should have read all the pages in that email from WestJet the other day. If you oh, wanted to really yeah, it. I guess that would have helped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anyways, a wonderful show today. Yes. Uh, we have uh, often asked ourselves, why don't we get somebody on here, a scientist on here to help explain certain things about uh, fish and fish behavior and, and feeding habits and fish the food chain, mm. fish environment. And I think we might have inadvertently got one on coming later on. His name, his name is Dr. Michael Twist. Now, he's coming on because um, we wanted to talk to him about the lack of ice on the Great Lakes this year and how it's going to affect fishing down the road. And because he is one of the few uh, members of a team that, that's all they do is study ice and its effects or lack thereof on the environment. Um, he's going to be joining us slowly around, but we're going to ask him about how uh, it will affect our fishing as well as the uh, e ecological potential disaster ahead with the lack of ice. Mm -hmm. Um, before technical. technical stuff. Yes. I have a feeling. I like, I like technical I stuff. I'm not too good with it, but I'll try. Wow. Well, you're good. You know. Napanee, you're not giving enough credit to Napanee, you know. No, Napanee was good. I just wasn't. You know? Oh, it was you yeah, that it was, was a bit of a learning oh. stumbling grounds there. It was not the teachers; it was the student. You know what I mean? I had fun so there, you, though. I so, had a lot of fun in Napanee. I'll tell you that right now. It was good times. <laughs> good times. <laughs> so they could have airlifted you to campus casing. It wouldn't have made they any difference. They could have brought there. me to the biggest university of Toronto. Mm. You know what I mean? And I would have been good at sweeping up the floors there. And that would have been about it right there. <laughs> uh, how are you liking the new season? The loving Fish it. And season? I'm loving it. I yeah. think it's a great look, great feel. Um, the shows are really slick uh, in look. And I think there's a good more storytelling to it. Still got lots of fish and fishing. Um, yeah, I think we've just uh, we've advanced a little bit more. I've had some buddies that have written me and said, even what's different about your show this year? Yeah. What's going on? There's something yeah. different. You know, they don't really notice it. So it's kind of subliminal, but which is good. That's yeah, a good way to have it. It's the best right? way to do it. Really. Yeah. Uh, so. We've gotten quite a few saying, Hey, love the show. Uh, yeah. Keep it up. Uh, can't wait for the next one and all yep. that stuff. So yep, yep, if yep. you're not one of those uh, and you don't like it, could you let us know? Would you mind reaching out to us? And, and uh, can we give them something if they, if they do that, Dean, is there, anything? do we want to give uh, people who don't well, like the show stuff? Well, no, I'm oh. just, I'm not saying oh, necessarily tell us that you don't like it. I'm saying tell us oh. what you think. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, we could probably put together like a contest for some hats or something. Something. I'm not, uh, I don't know if I have permission the, to give that the stuff. Power, away, but right? The power. The power. You, go to, you have to go to somebody for well, sure. Well, maybe yeah. we can speak to the right people, but that would be nice, wouldn't it? It would a be very incentive. Nice. Yeah. And, and also remember, folks, that uh, if you don't, a lot of days, or a lot of people nowadays don't have cable TV, et cetera. Go on YouTube on the following Monday. Every Monday right now, so the cycle of January, February, and end of March, every Monday our show moves over to our YouTube channel. Um, so you can see the entire episode on YouTube as well. Wow. So. Look at and I wonder what the quality level would be on YouTube versus on, say, Global, which, you know, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock uh, nationally. Yeah, TV like that, HD. I think it's pretty good. It depends on your monitor maybe, on your uh, where you're watching it. If you're watching it on a computer like a MacBook or something, I think it would be a very good quality. Well, that's what I have watched our stuff on. It is good. I mean, if you're watching it on a phone, it might be a little tough to get all the detail, I but it's still good. I can never figure that out. Yeah, I was do. watching on the plane last week. I was watching people viewing movies yeah. yeah for like two hours yeah on their phone like how do you how do you even see it well you know what i guess it's better than mm. staring at the back of a seat right well why not just have a nap Maybe they can't sleep that's always good is it on a, a plane flight? especially oh yeah that nice the roaring oh the i end. love you know uh, i don't want to get off topic because we we're short of time but i can my best possible sleeping environment is on a plane when the plane is on the tarmac. Yeah, when it's before waiting, you take it off. Waiting yeah. to lift off. Yeah. Like I miss pretty much 95% of the takeoff 
on every flight. That's good. If you can miss that, then you're through it. That sometimes it wakes me up. So then I get ah, damn it, I lost. Man, I just next thing I, I know wake it's so up nice, and, eh? She, you know, the lady is saying, "Sir, would you like a coffee a or something?" <laughs> oh, anyways. <laughs> Uh, we talked about the show uh, store, uh, Fishing Canada yeah. store. We talked about that. Winter sale going on there right now, by the way. Hell those yeah. of you interested. Uh, listener feedback. Oh, boy. Speaking of YouTube, Wayne3006. 30 odd six. That's a gun. Uh, oh, is Wayne that 30 odd six? six? Well, no, maybe. Maybe. You never know, but that's what the. Yeah. I think no, 30 odd six. It's 306. No, I think, I think it's 306, isn't it? 30 no, odd six. 306. Yeah. That's a caliber. Yeah. Yeah. 308, 306, right. three, three, not 300, not 300, 30-06. 30-06. Some people call it 30-06 for some reason. I heard 30-06 means zero. Yeah, so there But you it go. doesn't mean two zeros. Okay. This is two zero. This is Wayne with three, two zero, six. 30-ought. What is 30-ought then? 30-ought. 30-ought. It's two zeros. No. Nah, it's, not. Not. It's, I, it's like two watt, uh, it's like uh, three odd uh, fishing lure hooks things. Uh, Treble hooks that are single hooks. <laughs> Thirty odd six. Come on now. Oh god. By Anyways. the way, I sampled some, odd six? some tequila. Oh, last speaking week. of gunshots. And you know I'm not I'm not a tequila drinker a shot, by yeah. any means. Well good tequila is good. Well, right? I'm finding out more and more that good tequila is is better than the crap I drink. Oh hell yeah. Oh good tequila is I ran is into really one. nice. Did you, did Nick one. didn't get it to you, did he? No, no, it's Steve and I down in oh, okay. Orlando. Because Nick, he's, uh, he's been delving into some tequilas. Oh, uh, yeah? Tequilas, yeah. yeah I so. got to tell you. I know, it's nice. Sipping. <laughs> you sip it. Sip it. You can't, Bar tequila, anybody that's used to has never had good tequila, you know that clear bar tequila is oh. nasty oh. shit. You might as well be drinking gasoline and rubbing alcohol. Because yeah. that's what it tastes like, yeah. right? You're doing that to get drunk and plastered and stupid. Whatever. But... Yeah. This stuff, yeah, your time was sipping tequila. Wow. Andy was... DeLeo, remember Andy? He was a connoisseur. Yes, he was, and we didn't appreciate him at the he time. We go the heat of a, a shoot; it'd be the hottest shoot of the year. We'd all go in and order a cold beer, and Andy get a shot of tequila. We could Andy, never figure out why. What do you? What do you? Uh, you have a cold beer? No, no. This is what I want. <laughs> he was... It was 1942. Was the bottle? Hell was, yeah. Uh, Padron, or was it the other one? Don. Uh, Julio yeah, I know, there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know what you're saying. But. 1942. Wow. Best they make. Uh, I got to tell you. No kidding. This is not a, a obviously it's a free uh, in a, plug. In a, uh, in a bar or something like that? Did you no, in a, a liquor store. I bought it. I bought a liquor store. How much combien dollars than uh, uh, American? Uh, American. Let's, not, let's move on with the program. <laughs> Uh, listener feedback, Wayne3006. Uh, <laughs> on YouTube. From YouTube. And um, uh, on YouTube. Yes, and sir. he uh, says, uh, really like the show. And he's talking about Fishing Canada early season ESOCs, which just so our, aired Our first recently. show airing, yeah. and, it's, and it's on YouTube right now. Right so. now, as we speak. He says, really like the show, but guys, dot, 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 use a wire trace when pike fishing and put that pike gag in the trash. He could have, might as well have said... There's a bunch of bullshit. That's right, is what he's saying. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's something for the from the dark ages. Dark ages. So let's dark address dark. this. I'll dark. take the first part because I'm responsible for that. Okay. You're responsible for the second part of this. All right. So Mr. first Yellow. part is uh, when he says use a wire trace, we're going to make an assumption. You mean a leader. Yeah, I looked I looked it up quickly and it said it had showed pictures of leaders. So okay, I didn't so a trace is a leader. What he's referring to is that on... Uh, some pike shows, like the one that aired recently, uh, I, I don't use a leader all the time. I'm, 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 I, there's some baits that I do believe a leader, uh, especially a heavy leader, will um, take away the action of the lure. Absolutely. And so I just don't feel comfortable with it. It also, um, because of all the hardware on a leader, unless you make your own, which we do quite often, uh, there's hardware on either end, and, and it weighs the lure down. So it's fishing in a different part of the water column than I'd like to. There's a million reasons why I don't use a leader. I'm trying to use it more often because Peter really frowns when I'm, I give in, him poo -poo. When I'm in the boat without a leader on. But yes. Having said that, though, having said that, how many big pike have I caught without a leader? Absolutely. How many? How many big pike have we caught 
jig fishing for walleye. There's a single little there jig you, and you catch a 40 incher. That's right. So you know it I mean? doesn't mean that you're going to lose the fish. Um, I think maybe what Wayne 3006 maybe might be saying is that when you don't have a wire trace or leader on your line, you're going to have to fight the pike more in order to get it in and uh, released. Yeah, that baby, baby it, maybe. Is that what he's thinking? Maybe. You know? It certainly has nothing. I don't think it should have anything to do with the, the success rate of getting the fish and And that on. lure that Angela was using at that time is a suspending lure. So one of the one of the worst things you can do with a suspending lure is hang a great big chunk of hardware on it because what Angela says is it might be deeper than whatever, but it also it can make that lure that's supposed to sit Sink like down. that. can pull it down and it's sitting like that and it's sinking slow and this great big giant weed leader is going down. More. So there's a lot of effect on that lure that you're using for sure. So I, I get that part of it. I mean, it's, it's kind of a 50-50, yeah. right? You need a leader for those teeth, but you don't need a leader because that lure won't work properly. So it's a judgment call, right? So you're not killing anybody by doing it. Right? I didn't think so, but Wayne would disagree with you. The <laughs> second part of Wayne's problem. Uh, the second part of Wayne's problem is, uh, and put that pike gag in the trash. So the pike gag is obviously, it's a jaw spreader. Now, I just dawned on me, I just listened to you say that. Is it possible that Wayne is from um, Europe or, or yeah. maybe even England? The UK. Because both those, like the trace. And Sounds very the, British, doesn't it? The pike gag sound very British. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought. That was my first thought. Hey, and if so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wayne, for yeah. watching our we're product. Watching. Yeah, yeah. And we're just trying to explain. Our so the jaw spreader. So, Wayne, and that, so we rarely use the jaw spreaders, but we do use them. I will say that on pike. We don't fish musky a whole lot, so we've never had the need for, for jaw spreaders on muskies. And usually the baits are a lot bigger. In that case, that that bait, that SM has that same suspending bait, another version of it that Ange had on, was a small bait. And that pike literally engulfed that bait completely into its mouth. Like, I mean, it was right in past the teeth, et cetera, et cetera. So do you, do you cut that line and just leave that lure in the fish's mouth? No. Okay, no. no. So, okay, now you're saying open the fish's mouth up. So what do you use, a pair of pliers? Stick the pair of pliers, jam them in there, no. and open the pliers, and you're going to break his no. teeth. You're going to break the pike's teeth by doing that, for sure. So what we do is we find a time when the pike will open his mouth a bit. You take the spreaders, and you don't push it to the limit of the spreaders. You push it to the limit of when the fish just is not going to bite down on it because there's you can go too hard for sure on it you be careful with that you slowly take your pliers in you just lodge the hook pull it out and you let off the the spreaders and to us it's i mean to me i don't know i'm sure angel will agree with me it's probably the most humane way of humane. doing it you know what i mean so you're getting that you're not leaving that because that bait in his mouth is gonna eventually cause a problem you got two treble hooks in there plus five inches of bait it's probably going to create a problem so we feel uh, we got to get it out of there and the easiest way for us without holding the fish cranking on his gill raker and holding his jaw like that and then Ange shoves the pliers in there like that i, I don't know I think, the, I think and the it's dangerous. Spreaders. Yeah, it's dangerous for the I fish mean, and the humans. Exactly. Right? So, so it's, just our, it's just our uh, our way. Of I don't know whether I like the normal ones. Those you know, just a straight wire and you right, and you open it up and it's got two. They should have a flat surface. There's on some the of them answer. do. There yeah. are some that are made that have a flat on the top and, and opens like that. And even I think they might even have rubberized ones. Yeah, that like would that. Be, that would work. But you really, have to have some way of holding a, a pike's jaws open while you're. And maybe one, maybe to, one of those click grippers with that but you'd have to force his jaw down you know those yeah. those grippers that you can pick up no, fish with I and know, all that but that's but got to be it's got to be torquing on the jaw yeah problematic you know i don't know it's hard it's a hard one and i mean we don't use a jaw spreader unless we absolutely need it yeah. we have it on the yeah. boat just like, for, you know with, like once or twice you know a season yeah even yeah. that's how how rare exactly. we try and release the fish in the water um, we do pick it up periodically, but we do our best to minimize the impact that we have on it. If it's a gigantic fish, and in the case of Pete's talking about, the bait is not visible, yeah, you, right. you, you got to do it. There's a little tip for anybody that is using a jaw spreader. Okay, I'm on a smaller fish. I've done this before. I've got this, put the jaw spreaders in, got the lure out, said, ah, perfect, like that. And I threw the fish back with the jaw spreader still in them. In them. <laughs> Don't do that. Remember, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I've done it before, so. Yeah. Oh, God, I yeah. think it's happened to a few people, so. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, 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 Wayne, Wayne 30-06. 30-06. Appreciate that. Uh, Podcast Network highlights this week uh, under the canopy. Gets Jerry. The big Hello, nod. Jerry. Jerry O. We saw him yesterday. Wallet. I gets, love that name. Uh, Wallet. Jerry O. Uh, episode 23. Turkey Tail. It's actually harvest time number four. I don't know what that means. Do you know? Yeah, he's doing like a harvest time thing where he tells you like what's in like what's uh, in right now that you can go out and cool. harvest. So he does those, okay. think, once a month. All cool. right, so it's this is episode 23, though. I do have that is, correct, yep. right? Yep. Um, and it's all about this thing called turkey tail mushroom. Never heard of it. You? No, there's so many fungi that we've mm. never heard of, and they all have different applications. Including Jerry, he's quite a fun guy. He's a fun guy for <laughs> who, you, who knows about fun guy. <laughs> yes, sir. A fun guy who knows about fun guy. And uh, this particular one is uh, about turkey tail. It tells you its medicinal benefits, uh, including uh, helps balance blood sugar levels. Okay, this is good for diabetics, I'm assuming. Right? Right, it could be, be great. Good for, yeah. Great for diabetics. It boosts uh, athletic performance. Dean, Dean Taylor. Dean. Being uh, the athlete that he fight is. viral and bacterial infections. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. You still, you still got bacterial <laughs> infections, I know, and it reduces yeah. fatigue, which well, there you go. There you go, buddy. has got us. We all got to get wow. on the old turkey tail. The old turkey tail. I believe in Jerry's studying him. He says may help all these things. So we're, he's not, Jerry does not ever say, okay, it's going to help. It's going to help, but you know what? You know what? To me, is it's there kind anything of worth a try. that says is going to? Doesn't don't they all say whether it's medicine or herbal uh, solutions such as this? It may because not all of our metabolisms are the same. Our bodies, biologically question. speaking, we're different, right? And I what, just started my. I just told you I just started my acid reflux medicine, and right. it's and it's working. See, there you so go. So it, it it does work. Now I may take that, and it might not work. Right. Right. I, there was a, I had to experiment to find the right one. So Yeah, it's kind of like a, a booking an airline uh, <laughs> ticket. It may, it may, some of, I'm sure there are people who have taken off on time. Got home once I'm in a while. I'm sure. Went, but, you know, it might not. People like me, we don't tend to. So that's our turkey tail there, Dean? Yep, it looks just like one. Well, you know what? I've seen lots of that. It's on the yeah. side of trees, right? Yeah. Yep. Up on the, yep. yeah. Seen lots of that stuff. I didn't had no idea it was edible. I'll wow. reach down and uh, eat you some. Well, I wonder no, if now I, maybe you can't eat it raw. I maybe you have to looks, process it or I something. I think there was a warning in that podcast that it, there's a bunch of mushrooms that look like it that you should not be eating. Right. Uh, which is typically the case with a lot of these. I, so I, be I careful. I would sure. not. I don't think even if somebody told me that's a great mushroom to eat, I don't know if I could do that out in the wild. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. so it's so uh, gray that area. The bad stuff versus good stuff versus yeah. poison. I don't know. All the more reason why you need. To to listen to uh, Under the Canopy on Outdoor Journal Radio Podcast Network. It's uh, one of the leading programs in its category. Why? Because it's very informative. uh, It's a high-end product, and you might be able to differentiate between a good fun guy and a bad fun guy. There you go. Jerry Smart. Jerry's a smart man. In the news, Mr. Bowman, what do we have in the news this week? We have black-legged ticks, which are deer ticks. Uh, the population is rising in Saskatchewan. So I had no idea that Saskatchewan well, even had or didn't have. It's not populations rising. They have discovered them right. in Saskatchewan. They never, in the history of mankind, has there been evidence that the black-legged deer tick was in Saskatchewan. Well, now uh, they have found it. They, interesting way they they uh, sample how they found it. They drag a cloth <laughs> yeah. uh, through That's the cool, trails right? where people or dogs would normally walk or run and play and whatnot. And they drag uh, these cloths that are wool. And then at the end of it, they open it up and they check out all of the things that are on it. And lo and behold, for the first time ever, they have found a black-legged deer tick which is not good uh, for the folks in the province of Saskatchewan, which leads me to believe if they're in Saskatchewan, then they got to be in the neighboring provinces too, don't they? Well, if not, they're moving. Obviously, they're yeah. moving, right? If they weren't in Saskatchewan, they, I mean, we know Ontario right now is, is mm-hmm. at a horrible level. Southern Ontario is a horrible level of, of ticks, uh, black-legged mm. ticks. So, And then I, I'm assuming Manitoba is probably up there pretty good, too, right now. And now you're talking Saskatchewan. Is it going to go to Alberta? Is it going to go to B.C.? Is it, et cetera, et cetera. Is it going to move west like that? So um, are they moving east? 
I mean, you're talking about Newfoundland, the mosquitoes and black flies that they have. I mean, there's a bug problem there with that. And obviously, we're going to be talking about this a little later on with uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Twiss, because he's into this whole ecological impact of global warming. Uh, but um, Emily Jenkins, professor of microbiology at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, said ticks are emerging across North America lately with the black-legged variety showing up in places it hasn't before. She said climate change could be the factor. Yeah, that's, that's going to come up later for sure. You know what I mean? Yep. She goes on wow. to say, we've never had to work with uh, identifications over Christmas break before. So that uh, identify or definitely was a weird thing to find in 23. Also, here's a weird one that I found is that the species uh, usually hits its rise on migratory birds. Right. Like, uh, you know what? I've never, uh, we always thought, I didn't deer. know. Deer. Yeah, deer. <laughs> deer. The mice. The, uh, yeah. the mice was yeah. the problem. And well, all actually, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way it works is this. So the deer is not the vector. Deer is simply the transport transportation mechanism for black-legged yeah. tick. The mouse is the actual vector. Correct. Who, I believe so. Yeah. yeah, that's how it works. So if a tick bites a mouse who may have Lyme disease, then obviously from that point, that tick is a time bomb just waiting to land on a human and spread Lyme disease. The mouse, on the other hand, that's carrying Lyme disease has no ill effects of it at all. Mm -hmm. At all. The deer, which we thought forever was actually the vector, is not. The deer is simply right. a transportation unit. Like that, a goose. That, like a goose. Like here. a goose. Like yeah. a, a the, migratory they, bird, right. whatever. And so, uh, what about bears? Dean, the bears? Oh, yeah, they're loaded with Loaded, them. yeah, but it just yeah. doesn't affect them. It's right? got to be just It doesn't affect them either. Yeah, so a wolves, Travel. I'm assuming every animal with fur, every Travel. animal that moves yeah. in that, yeah. in the bush. Moose. I everything. Mean, huge. Got to have uh, Yeah, but the mouse is the only one... The mouse is the actual cause of the deer tick getting mm. Lyme disease that it then in turn spreads That's to humans. How bizarre so it's is mice. That? Think about how bizarre that is. So so technically, I guess if a mouse bit you and was able to puncture your skin. I had that once. Puncture your skin? Yeah. Or yeah? Oh yeah. Bad one? I had to go get a tetanus shot. So, oh, wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, as a so, kid. So if that mouse had have had Lyme disease, Lyme disease, you could have been infected. For sure. For sure. We used to turn, we used to go to this farmer's field and turn over the hay bales and the, and you'd see the mice scurrying around and we used to catch them. And then we'd get st stupid. We'd catch them with our bare hands and then finally yeah, one bit me says, okay, wait, we might want to use gloves if we're going to do this. In the future. <laughs> it's stupid Crazy. kids. <laughs> Anyways, uh, something to keep an eye on for sure. And for you folks in Saskatchewan, uh, you need to be Keep vigilant an eye open. Uh, this is, because it, it's it, not good. It can get ugly. And they mentioned sure. in that story that they were identifying ticks over c Christmas. Yeah. I got one this year in December. I got yeah. one last year in December too. How the hell do you do that? I think they came in on my dog. Like when we take him out for a walk, he gets probably four or five every time we go out. That's insane. And now you say four or five as if you were taking inventory uh, in a safe how do you know it's four or five? Oh, we dog? don't. It's four or five that come off them when we brush and oh yeah, it's, it's brutal. Wow. That's, it's bad. This, this part of Ontario, this, this east, east of us, basically that, you know, Coburgish, but Brighton, uh, Campbellford and on it's east. It's the hot zone. The Napanee, Mikey tells me about all kinds. He goes, every year he gets infested with them. Yeah. He has to go shower. His wife has to pick him mm -hmm. off him. He's gone, he's gone on the medicine like you did yep. many times. Wow. Many times. It's crazy. It really yeah, is we've got to keep an eye on that for sure. Anyways, that's all. Uh, that wonderful story is uh, sitting in the news at fishingcanada.com as we speak. Go in there, inform yourself, and... Uh, and beware. And while you're there, get into that contest. Like, that, what are you yeah, waiting for? Yeah. People from Saskatchewan can win, right, Dean? They've won. Yeah, they've won before. We've, yeah. we've sent gifts out to yep. Saskatchewan, yeah. Of course. There you go. Of course. Fan question of the week submitted by Ray Ooh. <laughs> Who? Ray, Ray O. 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 O U G H. O, o U G H. O. Ray o. 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 It's a very unique name as well. Hey? From Manitoba, by the way. You just mentioned Manitoba. That's right, I did. Ray uh, submitted his question via email. And uh, you too, by the way, can do the same. Uh, send your questions to info at fishingcanada.com info at fishingcanada.com that will get uh, sent or you can instagram and facebook etc 
But that will get sent to our very own Dean Taylor, who in Come turn will print that off on uh, 80 stock white paper, just like this. And then he will put that question in a barrel, in a drum, actually. It can't be called a barrel. It's a drum. 45-gallon drum. Well, because the barrel is traditionally made out of wood, this drum is definitely metal. You could play the Maybe calypso music a, on it. He's got an old whiskey barrel that he uses. Maybe no, it's metal. I've seen oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was all, I remember when he brought it in. It was all rusted up and everything. And oh. Cleaned it all up, painted it up, uh, put fan questions CLR on it. CLR on it and yeah, yeah. doused it. And, yeah. And, uh, There's a bunch of bullshit. It is not. <laughs> Stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, send your uh, question uh, to <laughs> Fish and, <laughs> info at Fish in Canada, and uh, we will endeavor to answer it for you, much like Ray's question today from Manitoba. Ray, from Manitoba. So let's start this one without the question first. First off, Manitoba has a, uh, a program out there called the Master Angler. Oh, program, I love that. And in which you can get a certificate if you catch a certain sized fish. In Manitoba. So, Ray's question is: When when's the best time to target master, eighty nine centimeter to thirty five inch in brackets lake trout, Lakers? So, are you, so yeah, he's just specifically referring to the Giants. master angler award. He wants, the, big, awards, he wants right? the biggies, right? Just a, a just a quick backup on that award. It's been around forever. Yeah. I remember my first trip to Manitoba. Um, I don't know what lake it was somewhere. Uh, Mine was at Knee Lake when I first discovered oh, this. Oh, before even Knee, but yeah. Knee was certainly one. Yeah. But but yeah, I remember them uh, talking about talking masters. about it's all they talk about, right? And I thought it was such a great program at the time. They basically anybody who fishes in the province of Manitoba, obviously legally, meaning you have to have a license, um, are eligible to enter fish in the program. And it's not a fish. It's all fish that hit a certain uh, There's size. There's 30 species on this list here yeah. in front of me. 30 species that you can uh, that you can submit for a uh, master angler. It's a great program. So and I thought it was really good. Is. Back 40 years ago when I first uh, was is exposed to it, I thought oh, it was probably one of those little tourism things that come and go. But it was kind of cool. Well, you know what? It's still going to this day. They have largemouth so. bass on that. I didn't know they had largemouth in Manitoba. I was not aware of it. It's on the list. I don't know. Maybe... Yeah. Yeah, Why wouldn't they, though? Yeah. Why would we be surprised yeah. that largemouth have made right it? right on the cusp of Ontario, right? It's, uh, got them in Saskatchewan. Yeah. We got well, them in Ontario. That's right. So there must be. Anyways, uh, going back to, so big Lakers. I mean, for the, for the lack of experience that I've had, I'm not a real lake trout guy, but I would, my first choice would be the, the last two weeks of the every season so wherever you are in manitoba when these big females are getting ready to move up on the shoals to spawn i would say that's there's when they're at the heaviest so you, we talk weight a lot of times but that means obviously heavier are longer etc cetera, etc cetera. um lake nipigan for example chad up at lake nipigan uh Pasha lake cottages he goes out in late uh september 30th is our closer up there he goes out in the last two weeks of september and he says he just catches giant after giant after giant so if you can find time at where You've missed the males. They go up first, I believe, and get into those females. Um, to me, that would be probably the best suggestion I could give you on that one. So Yeah, I, I, if you're looking for weight, but the Master Angler Award is not based on uh, weight. It's 35 inches. It's inch based or... on length. Great, but you're so, looking at the, and that's the biggest fish, the biggest females. Well, right? yeah, but I'll tell Hello. you. Look at that. Look at that mm -hmm. damn master right there. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Hey, you just kind of scared me with the size of that fish. Early in the season, <laughs> uh, in most northern lakes, Manitoba, for the most part, it's fishable lake trout yes. lakes are, are, would be At considered out, northern right? compared to us. Mm -hmm. Ice out is the is prime time because there's that that window of opportunity when the fight ice first goes out if it coincides with the opening um man oh man you can get it some big fish shallow and i i don't know whether they would be longer than the late season fish but i'll tell you what they are is more apt to jump on your bait Aggressive, that time of sure. day or that time of year because they're they're chowing down and everything so and, and through the know, ice would be a good one too i mean obviously a lot of people fishing through the you, ice you, now you're you're sitting right on top of these giants i mean the yeah. guys in northwest territories uh, ryan gregory they, yeah. they catch monsters and i mean they get big ones in the open water but now they can concentrate their spot right they can say okay here's where i'm going to fish today and i'm going to work this little area uh, and uh, i i think more important than
than the season or the time is the location. If you're looking for a personal, look at that, speaking of personal best. What the? Exactly. Woo. If you're looking for. Um, nice, gar nice portable Garmin you got there, buddy. Thank you. You're I you're work welcome. out. You're welcome. Yeah. Good for you. It uh, shows. It's, thank you. <laughs> uh, location is the most important thing, in my opinion. It doesn't. The time of year is not as relevant as location. If you want to catch a personal best or, in this case, a master angler uh, lake trout, then you need to scout for your location. You need to study location. And one of the best places to look is at the master angler awards because they publish every year they publish their all their master angler awards. And all you have to do, and they tell you what lake they're on. Ah, and so all you have to do is figure you, out, eh? yeah, all you have to do is narrow it down. We used to do that. Like in the eighties and early nineties, if we were going into Manitoba, we used to actually look at that. Why wouldn't you? If there are more master angler award fish coming out of Lake X versus Lake B, then why wouldn't I put myself on Lake X regardless of the time of year? So I think location, because genetically there are, there are uh, lakes that have ge the genetics on that lake for whatever reason. We've talked about it for walleye, but lake trout are no different. Where they just are a superior fish. They're bigger fish. Mm -hmm. Whatever yeah. strain you're, you're started right. the... You're, if you know the movements of your fish, they should be able to follow them spring, sure. summer, fall, and winter. Exactly. Right? My, God, we mentioned, yeah, Ann's mentioned spring, I mentioned fall. And then we sat through the ice. My biggest lake trout came midsummer, and that was in Saskatchewan. Yeah, that was, I, and I was trolling 100 feet deep of water, you yep. know, with the three waist swivel uh, rig, and I got an a ma absolute massive beast, biggest lake trout. So it, it can happen at any time, but and hope, I hope we answered somewhat of this question. I don't know, Ray. Hopefully it helped you somewhat. We tried the best we can. Don't forget, if you have a question you would like to uh, ask us, uh, submit it to info at fishincanada.com. The humble goldfish, everyone's favorite aquatic pet. It's small, easy to care for. What's there not to love? Even the cat may be mesmerized by the color and movements of your aquarium friends. Goldfish are great at home, but don't let them loose. Releasing goldfish or other domestic aquatic pets or plants into natural environments is harmful to both your pet and the planet. Goldfish disrupt ecosystems by outcompeting native species for food and resources in degraded habitats. They contribute to algae blooms, they kill aquatic wildlife, and pass viruses and diseases contracted in aquariums to wild fish. They could even live up to 40 years and grow as big as a football. Anglers, this is where you come in. If you find a goldfish at your local fishing spot, report it to the Invading Species Hotline or go online to eddmaps.com. Remember to never dump your live bait into the water and risk spreading other aquatic invaders. Keep our lakes free from invaders and don't let them loose. There's an adventure just outside these walls. It's something you'll hate to leave and can't wait to get back to. It's a place where memories are made and bonds are forged. For some, it's hitting the trails. For others, it's a weekend at the lake. It's a place full of campfires and quality time. This year, take some time to reconnect with friends, family, and nature. No matter what adventures await you, Coleman has the gear you need. Visit ColemanCanada.ca to gear up today. The outside is calling. Answer the call. How did a small town sheet metal mechanic come to build one of Canada's most iconic fishing lodges? I'm your host, Steve Nidswicki, and you'll find out about that and a whole lot more on the Outdoor Journal Radio Network's newest podcast, Diaries of a Lodge Owner. But this podcast will be more than that. Every week on Diaries of a Lodge Owner, I'm going to introduce you to a ton of great people, share their stories of our trials, tribulations and inspirations learn and have plenty of laughs along the way meanwhile we're sitting there bobbing along trying to figure out how to catch a bass and we both decided one day we were going to be on television doing a fishing show my hands get sore a little bit when i'm reeling in all those bass in the summertime but that's might be for more fishing than it was punching you so confidently you said hey pat 
Have you ever eaten a drum? Find Diaries of a Lodge Owner now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, uh, let's get on to the main subject matter here this week. Uh, joining us now is Dr. Michael Twiss. Uh, he is Dean of Science at Algoma University and also co-chair of uh, Winter Science Working Group with the International Joint Commission. But best of all, he's an avid outdoorsman yes, and yeah, uh, loves to do what we do. Welcome to the program, Michael. Well, thank you very much, uh, Angelo, and, uh, and nice to see you and Pete today. Well, Excellent. thank you. Thank you Appreciate sir. it. And now I'll go to my university. It's in Sault Ste. Marie, correct? That's right. Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Okay. So he's, Ontario, yeah. He probably knows Carol Caputo. He might. Carol knows everybody. <laughs> you never know. She, she's our tourism, uh, Northern Ontario tourism lead um, oh, nice. that we've been working with for, it seems like, 100 years. Of course, Carol will not appreciate oh, me saying that. Oh, she's going to so. hate you for I that. Know. What is the status okay, well, of... I've been here for uh, 11 months. Oh, um, okay. I was in upstate New York for 20 years. Oh, wow. And, but I, I grew up in northern Ontario, so I'm kind of like coming home. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Nice, 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 nice. What is the status of Dean in a new university? Are you like the... the uh, Boss. The, the big man, the head cheese? Middle, middle management. <laughs> middle management, okay. 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 Yeah. I'm the guy who's torn in half. Oh, ah, boy. Ah, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, the genesis of this episode and why we got you on here today, um, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of people are scratching their heads, although this weekend... Um, might seem a little different, but we haven't had any real cold weather. We haven't had, in Southern Ontario, we have no ice. And in fact, um, according to, um, Dean, did you put this together for us? I put it together for you. Thank yeah. you. So according to Dean. The Dean of all uh, Deans. The Dean of yeah. all Deans. The Dean of all Deans. <laughs> um, <laughs> across the Great Lakes, which is sort of our measuring stick, uh, we had less than 4%, less than 0.4%. Um, right. of the uh, water uh, was hard. The rest was uh, was still uh, no ice surface at all, which is pretty unusual, uh, certainly not in the last couple of years, but historically speaking, uh, we'd have normally 9% of the Great Lakes by January 1st would be covered with ice. And uh, obviously, you know, we look at it as anglers and say, oh man, I'm not going to be able to go ice fishing this year. And yeah, uh, you know, But we sometimes uh, don't really think it through and see what the real implications could be. So we reached out to you and we appreciate you joining us today. Maybe you can shed a little bit more light at what the long-term ram ramification might be from this trend, which obviously we're in. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about a, a bit about my, uh, my research area. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a, I'm a Dean of Science here at Algoma University, um, and I define myself as a Great Lakes researcher. Okay. So I've been studying the Great Lakes for over 25 years now. Um, <clears throat> and so when we talk about ice, you know, just to, to develop some context here, um, the Great Lakes are what we call geologically young. Okay. Okay. It was wow. like 10,000 to 6,000 years ago, they were ice covered. Wow. Like, kilometers of ice wow <clears throat> so we've come a long way baby um <laughs> and the problem is though that <clears throat> as the lakes change over time um we have to adapt with them and and we have adapted with them the one of the problems though as you've probably heard before <clears throat> is that there are some changes that occur in the environment that we're not ready for you know we don't we're not we're not prepared for the changes. And so something like ice cover is, is one of those changes. Um, another one is things like, you know, having ticks in Saskatchewan, you know, right. were they yeah, always we, there before? Yeah. Right. You know, all of a sudden, Hey, I don't know that what I've got a disease now, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, all of a sudden it's more costly. You got to pay for all those medicines for your dogs and whatnot. But getting back to ice, um, this is something that has a big impact. And you guys definitely are aware of the recreational end of things mm -hmm. right so it impacts businesses things like that um it also impacts uh things like how people access the water um i was uh talking to some hockey referees in sault st marie michigan on the other side of the of the river last weekend because i ref so that's my contact with ice um and you know a few months ago they're talking about hunting and whatnot 
you know, showing the bucks they're getting. And then just last weekend, they're showing these big pictures of pickerel and whatnot. And they're talking about how this one bay where normally they're, when there's enough ice, they go further out and they get better success, mm-hmm. you know, because there's different color water mm-hmm. that they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and so in different times of day. And so someone who's not aware of that knowledge might hear someone say, oh, yeah, you got to get it where the water is this color and might venture further out on the ice and, you know, have an accident. Uh, when I was in upstate New York, uh, I would hear periodically about the problems on Lake Champlain with folks getting out there and then losing trucks. And um, sometimes people lose their lives you know, right, because right. of unstable ice conditions. And so that's there's definitely a safety concern. And up here, um, just on the just northwest of here on Batchewana Bay, um, there's the Batchewana First Nation. And folks there are complaining that the lack of ice is causing them to lose a bit of their culture. Wow. Their Mm. language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, these guys have their technology for fishing under the ice, you know, with gill nets and whatnot. And it's, you have to have certain ice conditions, et cetera. And, you know, when you guys talk about jargon and stuff like leaders and jaw spreaders, you know, there's a language that, you know, it's simple to say. And in their case, there's certain words that they use to explain the technology behind fishing and the seasons and whatnot. And so when it's not safe to go out, they're not going to go out. And so that little kid who has the opportunity to go out with his uncle or go out with his grandfather who know the language, he misses that opportunity. And so he's off doing something else, you know? And so there's a, uh, there's a lost, lost opportunity there. So there's, there's a lot of impacts, you know, it's, Never even thought of that. And they've never safety. even dawned on me. Yeah, that that sure. whole yeah. part of it. Yeah. Just, I mean, that goes to say that not just with the uh, Native community there, but also anybody. Because if you yeah. are annually, Absolutely. you know, doing the trip with Grandpa and, and Uncle Jim out on the ice, yeah. when you don't have that, things Maybe, change, making right? Making a you, skating rink, a little ice rink for yeah, every yeah. night, nightly skating for the community or something like that. Yeah, we don't even think of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and so you you lose those opportunities, and there's, there's a that lack of connection. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, kids are pulled away from um, traditional things because of the attraction of you know video games and things like that. And so, if they lose an opportunity to do something that their family does, yeah, they lose the they lose that technology and that the ability to transfer not only the the recreational experience but also the other values that come along with that hopefully good ones, right? Mm -hmm. Um, From a scientific point of view, there's also some pretty interesting things that can happen as well. Um, Folks at Clarkson University, where I was in upstate New York, um, are responsible for measuring all the contaminants and fish for the U.S. EPA throughout the Great Lakes. And what they found over the past decades is the concentration of things like PCBs are going down, 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 down. Good story. That's good, yeah. Yep. Except that it stopped. They know that the flux or the, the amount of PCBs going into the lakes has been reduced and should be being buried in the sediments, except that they stabilize and they start to climb up again. And what's going on? Is it changes because of zebra mussels? And they think, no, not because of that. It's connected to, they, they, they concluded, lack of ice cover in the near shore environment. Wow. So, yeah. So what's happening is your winter storms are coming in and they're kicking up the mud. Oh, right. And that, yeah. And that's resuspending and getting into the food chain. It's getting to your fish. Wow. And so we're doing a good thing by cutting back uh, PCBs. We're cleaning up contaminated areas. Right. But there's that legacy, that history that that's still biting us. And it's connected to climate change, lack of ice cover. Wow. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. For people, just very quickly interject here, for people that are listening that have never experienced the Great Lakes or seen the Great Lakes, you have no idea of such a monster they can be when the wind, like Michael was talking about, when oh. the wind comes up. We well, live on Lake Ontario here, Michael, and, and when that wind comes from the south, southwest, even southeast, it is unbelievable. For It's it's a sight to see, and it, the, there's white caps as far as you can see, and it doesn't even look that big. You get close to that lake, those are six, eight, and, and maybe Pens. even bigger footers. Yeah. It's yeah. huge. So what he's talking about lifting up that sediment, that's, I mean, it's doing it at a, a high pace level huge so 
They're unreal. Yeah, and, and, so, and, scale. and so when the <clears> ice <throat> is formed, that doesn't happen, obviously, right? The longer the ice is on, the for, less. For the apt. shoreline, at least. Eh? Yeah. Right. For yeah. And so I've, I've been out on uh, ice breakers on, on Lake Erie, and we've had 40 knot winds. Oh. Wow. And you could, and you could have played pool. Really? That stable. Yeah, because we locked in the ice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the ice actually protects the um the lake from uh from the wind essentially. Wow. And so it's called stratify. Like you guys know where the thermocline is, right? Right. right. Get your line to the thermocline. Um in the wintertime it's it's inverted. Right. So when water gets to four degrees Celsius, it sinks. When it gets colder than four, it starts to float until the point in which you got ice, which is solid and colder than, you know, See? One we talk, one degree Celsius. We talked about this on last week's podcast about the warm right. pan of water being yeah. down there. See? Yeah, yeah, Doctor yeah. just verified that. Well, see, we don't lie to people. We tell they the truth. Eh? Now yeah, what's what's the difference? The now we got summertime, spring, summer, and fall. When it's obviously the wind is going to do the same thing uh, on those windy days. It's going to be ripping up the sediment, et cetera, et cetera, versus the winter. Uh, is there a difference in that timing? Yeah, there sure is. Like what happened last weekend with that wind and storm? You don't get that kind of energy coming in the summertime. You'll get brief storms. You don't get those sustained right. day-long high winds. That's like hurricane season. Um, okay. The wintertime, you get that pretty frequently. Okay. Okay. Um, and the other thing that happens in the summertime is that that warm water on the top, the warm surface layer, actually protects down below. And so you'll get all sorts of currents in the surface waters because of the wind. Mm -hmm. And where that surface water meets the shore, that's actually, you can get, you know, um, wave action, resuspending, eroding shoreline, some, all that. But down deep, under the thermocline, it's calm. Mm -hmm. No matter what's happening up top. Huh. And so... There's, there's wow. the, 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 the surface waters and the ice protect the lakes. Um, that's, but, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and what I could mention is, you know, things like the time of year and, and fish reproduction. So some fish, you know, spawn at different times of year right. and, and um, things like uh, whitefish, which is really tasty. Mm. Um, mm hmm yeah, um, that, uh, that, that tends to spawn late in, the, late in the winter, and it needs ice cover. And so, um, actually, I'll correct that. I don't know if it's, if it's early winter or late winter, um, but, you know, because I study phytoplankton, the really small things, so nice. I might want to talk to a fish biologist next. But anyway, I do know that they, 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 they spawn and they lay eggs in the wintertime. And what happens is, they lay them on these shoals, usually in protected areas, like bayments and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so th that those are usually ice covered this time of year. And when they're not, what happens is those big deep waves um, can reach the bottom because the temperature is the whole scene if there's no ice. And uh, and that can bash the eggs around. Um, and if they do hatch, um, the little larvae get bashed around as well. Because yeah. under the ice, it would be yeah. pretty very quiescent, yeah, very, right, very, very right, calm, yeah. um, but under no ice cover, um, they get they get beat up. Are there any and studies so, that uh, we could uh, be made aware of that that might show just how impactful that is on uh, on on the spawn and on you know the the, the next season? Or I guess it'd be three or four years down the road when we would exactly, see it, right? As anglers, exactly. Right? So you would see a sort of a, a, a missing age class, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. to be, be reduced and you go oh my fishing fishing is really lousy this year right because of something that happened you we, know, four we, or five years wow, ago we forgot yeah. about that yeah, right? yeah. we as anglers yeah, we yeah you do about that. You, <laughs> you think you suck how come it's so yeah, we crappy? suck man what yeah. do we do yeah, we can't we catch suck. them <laughs> we do <laughs> yeah so you know that that's the whole idea that, that that knowledge if you're out in the water like you guys are you can start putting together all that information sharing stories with other folks you know and then mm. you start understanding a bit more about how the environment responds to yeah. to a changing to a changing climate yeah michael um as i told you at the beginning i'm fascinated with the whole food chain process and and microscopic <laughs> little life forms are the ones that you know really they're they're the genesis of our angling uh, opportunities that we have because without that we'd have no game fish Let's talk about that for just a moment and how this 
a rather warm winter is going to have an effect on that. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I can tell you some 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 observations that we've made on Lake Erie. Okay. Okay. So we started going out on Lake Erie in 27, 2007. Uh, we get on a Canadian icebreaker called the Griffin, and uh, we go out with them. And that's where you. To, that's where you were playing billiards. That's where you're playing pool. Oh, you could have. You could have. And that ball did yeah. not sway no, one. No, no, no lean to the table. What's so perfect? <laughs> yeah, <they> shot. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't help that That's one. That's good. That's good. Uh, so we we were out every year up to 2017, almost 10 years. Um, and I think it was 2012, um, which was near ice free. Um, and what happened was the type of algae that we saw was quite different. And so when we went out in 27, 2007, um, we wanted to know what's happening out on the lakes in the wintertime, because for the most part, most of the time we were able to access the middle of the lakes is when those EPA vessels, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans vessels are out. And that's usually summertime, spring to late summer. They don't sample in the in the winter time and so when i was at uh, crown metropolitan university back in 2001 actually just after 9 11 we ended up getting uh, a week of ship time on lake erie it was the last week of the of the year and they said Are you sure you want to go out then i said yes and so we went out and it was remarkable the water looked very different in these space. these spaces are usually nice and clear it was very chalky looking um we spent, you know, the week just kind of hiding behind uh, Long Point because if we went out on the lake, we wouldn't be able to do the work because the waves were so much. Um, but that was interesting, and that really piqued our interest in getting out in the solid winter. And then, so starting 2007 and onwards, we'd go out. Um, and the first time we went out in 2007 with the icebreaker crunching through the ice, you know, we started off down in Amherstburg on the Detroit River. Yeah. And as we moved out into the lake, we could see this brown water. I'm going to show you this, wow. this piece of leather. It's brown, okay? Yeah. And it looked like, you know, prop wash, the sediment. Yes. Yeah. Shipping yeah. channel, shallow enough, yeah. the ship's big enough. Um, but then we got into the middle of the lake where it's like 26 meters deep. And we'd see these patches of, of algae, dark like this under the water. Well, we didn't know it was algae at first. And so we, we, we said to the Coast Guard guys, it's like, what's this? They said, well, that's... Uh, we call that brown ice. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Brown. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, we actually had some microscopes. My colleagues had microscopes. We, we looked at it. It's like, sure enough, it's algae. And it was algae growing in these long filaments. And these algae are the types that have a lot of uh, lipids and oils in them. And it helps them stay buoyant. And so they're actually right under the surface of the ice. And so when the ship would go through, you'd see all this stuff get get rise to the top yep. and we were just fascinated because we actually were able to make those measurements for measuring like the amount of chlorophyll that they have that they use for photosynthesis the base of the food chain mm -hmm. we found out that it was higher than you get in the summertime on lake erie sometimes and that was really fascinating for us and and that got published that drew a lot of attention so we kept going out every 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 winter to look at these 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 uh these diatoms they're called type of type of algae um, in 2012, without any ice cover, it looked totally different. There was algae, but they're these little, little ones, you know, that don't have the same kind of oil in them because they don't need it for buoyancy. Mm -hmm. And so what may have happened, we don't have the proof of it, but we could hypothesize or, or kind of guess that maybe the zooplankton, the little shrimps that eat the algae, might not have been getting the good oils that they need. And so these diatoms create certain types of uh, what are called fatty acids. They're essential for, you may have heard about them in your diet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You kind of need, need them. Um, and so do fish and so do zooplankton and so do algae. Um, and so we could hypothesize that maybe that year, the fish ultimately that eat the zooplankton might not have been as healthy. And so maybe that affects the, 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 the year after you know, reproduction. These are just questions that we have. Um, so as, as the next year, uh, ice covered and it's back to normal. Algae wow. is good then. Algae in a body of water is good in order to 
um, keep the zooplankton, phytoplankton, et cetera, uh, well fed? Well, algae, algae are, are a type of phytoplankton. So okay. algae are, are uh, phytoplankton is made up of algae, which are like really right. to, to plants or in your grass and your trees outside. Right. And then there's cyanobacteria, which cause the, uh, the, the blue green algae blooms. Okay. Right. Um, and so both of those together are called phytoplankton. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's the base of the food chain. Um, the, the, Getting back to the fatty acids, those those are fish smell like fish because of diatoms. Oh, oh wow! Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, you've heard of them putting, uh, you know, not dye, but uh, bits of uh, well, actually they grow they grow algae and they put it into fish feed. So when they feed them on fish farms, they turn a color. Right. And so that that right. these 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 are, these are these compounds that, that transfer the food chain just like some contaminants do. So um, as it turns out, there's, there's a lot of things happening in the lakes in the wintertime. And the, the, you know that, you know, bears might go to sleep in the wintertime, but, but there's fish don't. Right. You know, fish move around. They still have to feed. Um, they've got to have food. Their food needs to eat and they need to eat algae. Now in the great lakes, it's a bit different than, uh, than smaller lakes and even streams. And so if you're, if you're fishing trout, the carbon that they're eating comes a lot from the forest around them because that's where the, 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 most of the photosynthesis is occurring. And so the leaves are falling in the water and then your insects are eating that, breaking down the leaves, you know, those little fish, uh, little fly larvae and stuff like that. And that's what the trout, you know, hammer. Out in Lake Ontario, I mean, I've been out there in October, middle of the lake. I don't see a leaf anywhere. Right. No kidding. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get, How does it work? <laughs> <laughs> but you still have a lot of fish. Yeah. And so in that case, in the Great Lakes, the lakes themselves are supporting all that phytoplankton, that production. That's, that's the forest there. The phytoplankton, the diatoms, the algae, the cyanobacteria, that's, that's the forest in the lake. Mm. And that's the difference between big lakes and small lakes. So that's interesting. Without ice cover, is that um, is there? A, 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 can we say that there's a lack of production at that level then, because of the movement of the water, the wind, the sediment, all that stuff? Is that affecting that plankton from reproducing and you know feeding the next level? That's a really good question. That's a good question um, because, you know, we do know that when there's no ice cover, say on Lake Erie, that we see a lot of algae still, mm -hmm. um, but it's mixed all the way to the bottom. And so, and when it's turbid or when it's cloudy because of wave action, that means the light doesn't penetrate very deep. Right. Yeah. You go onto a lake like Lake Superior out here um, in May your surface water could be 60 to 80 meters deep. Gotcha. And so when the wind blows, those algae go from the top where they see the light. It's a nice clear water. When you're down 80 meters, it's dark. dark. Yeah. And they might come back up again, but it might be during the night. And down they go again. Mm. And so the productivity in Lake Superior is really low because of how deep it is and how the algae cycle. In a lake like Lake Erie, it's much more, they spend much more time in the presence of light if it's not turbid. Right. But because it's so shallow, it tends to get cloudy. So the question you're asking is really, it's a, it's a good question. It's complicated. In other words, in other words, you don't have the answer, do you? That's correct. I don't. But I can, I can, I can have off size please, a lot. Please, please do. Uh, that's funny uh because i mean that's that's what we we live on that kind of information as anglers because yeah. we know that what we're harvesting and cultivating at the end of the day comes from microscopic life forms that we have absolutely no idea for, uh, that they even exist and i the more as anglers the more we understand about that food cycle 
The better we understand it, the easier it is for us to find fish. And finding fish is the key, right? Um, yeah. And we're constantly, constantly looking for a leg up on that yeah, part Yeah, the next of it. little step yeah. that we didn't know before, yeah. For example, I will ask you now, does this um, life form, um, does it, is it affected by temperature at all? No, that's a really good question. Oh boy! And this one, I this one I know the answer to. <laughs> okay, good. <Go ahead. laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> so um, I measure photosynthesis, right? So you guys know what that is. Yep. And you, you can measure it in water as well because there's phytoplankton that that photosynthesize. And when we went on to Lake Erie, um, we were measuring photosynthesis on the ship, and we found out that the rates of photosynthesis when the water is zero. 0.1 to 4 degrees Celsius is just as rapid as it is when it's 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. It's just as rapid. And so it's the light and the availability of nutrients that really drives it. The algae in the wintertime that live there, they're called Olacosyra. It's, it's a pretty name. You might want to call a dog that someday. Um, <laughs> and so these Olacosyra, they thrive at those low temperatures. They're cryophiles, they're psychrophiles, they're your snowmobilers of the uh, phytoplankton world. But when it gets to 10 degrees Celsius, they start dying. And they make these spores that go to the bottom, and they don't get resuspended until the fall winds come and, and stir them back up again. Wow. So, so, they, so you have both. You have you have warm water and cool water, uh, mm -hmm. sounds like, right? Which which makes different sense. Different populations. Right. But makes sense if they yeah. are the base food for everything that we know that swims in water, then it makes sense that there is a version that will sustain itself under cold periods. And there's a version that sustains itself under warm water conditions. And I, I'm, I, I'm asking you these questions. I'm getting to, I'm going to make my point here. One of the most okay. difficult uh, um, things as anglers that we have to face and more so in the northern part of uh, North America mm -hmm. are, are weather changes. You know, we call them cold fronts. When a cold front moves through, the fishing generally gets a little more uh, complicated, not difficult, but a little more complicated. And that's all based on availability of food for the predators. And so, you know, we're constantly trying to figure that out, that what is the key to that puzzle? If the food becomes more scarce, and in this case, that would be the phytoplankton, say, under cold water conditions, might not be as prolific a breeder as it normally would, which means that the next level of predator that feeds on it is not going to be as active, and that means the next level is not as active, and then the fish that we're after are totally inactive. At that point, we're trying to figure out, constantly trying to figure out, uh, first of all, what causes that. And, and that's why I'm asking you the questions about temperature. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, how do you combat it? If if you're in that situation as an angler, rather than just throw your hands up and say, well, I guess I ruined my weekend by choosing this one to go fishing instead of painting the fence like my wife wanted me to. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah. Um, how do we I figure this out? Yeah. Help us figure out this puzzle. Yeah, so... You know, the Great Lakes are are pretty massive. Um, they don't change temperature very quickly. Right. They don't. Um, in fact, where we are in Sault Ste. Marie, you know, the what temperature here is sometimes a couple degrees Celsius warmer than just north of here. I say that. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, Michael. On Lake Ontario, it's yeah, the same, same thing. thing. And especially in the really? fall, it's it's okay. warmer than everything else around it. It's even in the uh, bays that are connected to it. Lake Ontario is warmer than a bay connected to it. It's weird. It's exactly. freaky. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Because it, it takes a long time to cool off, a long time to warm up. Right. Um, the deeper the lake, the less it moves, changes. Like Lake Erie, people say, oh, it's the warmest lake. And they say Lake Superior is the coldest. Right. No, 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 no. Lake Erie is both the coldest and the warmest lake. Wow. Because it generally would freeze over 100% right. most winters. Yeah, yeah. But not, but not Superior, but Erie would, because it cools off faster. Um, hmm. so, so when you got weather changes coming in like that, um, <clears throat> in, in the Great Lakes... 
the temperature is not going to be a factor as much as I would say wave action um, and resuspension. Fish move around. Um, they don't like being bashed around, I don't think, although not quite sure. Maybe their maybe their prey fish move around more. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe they get closer to shore or further offshore. I'm, I'm not I'm not quite certain. I know that there's right now a thing called GLATOS, G L A T O S, and if you look it up, they've got uh, transponders and fish all across the Great Lakes, and they're able to follow fish and track where they move. And so we know now that walleye, pickerel, uh, move around the lakes. You know they can they can follow they can they they, they tag one and they see oh it's down near Toledo and it's it's on its way over to Buffalo and mm. they move they move and so what they're hoping to do they started collecting these data years ago but you know we need people like yourselves perhaps to sort of provide information on you know what well, success at certain times of day certain times of year certain places under certain weather conditions you can start putting that all together. Um, and that's actually important when you think about it because, you know, we have to respect um, fishing regulations. Right. And so if all of a sudden you get so much information that you kind of game the system, um, you can you, you can hurt it, right? Absolutely. You can hurt it. Like, Absolutely. Like I don't shoot deer in the summertime for a reason. Right. One, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> um, secondly, um, uh, it's, you know, you got to respect it. Right. And, and it goes back to like that, that relationship you have with the land and with the people that you're out there with. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's my proselytizing for the day. Is, okay. Michael, in, in this lack of ice time right now, is there mm-hmm. a certain species of fish that's affected more than others? The Great Lakes has a lot of species of fish in it, right? Yep. Or is there anything in particular that's, oh my God, this is really bad for them? I'm, I'm most concerned with dick and egg, whitefish. Because um, you like to eat them. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> delicious. It's not whitefish. I don't market. Oh, my God. That's so good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's in such demand. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of them because, yeah, they're such a good food. And even in lakes where you might not be able to eat the salmon or the trout, you might be able to eat them because they're lower in the food chain. Right. Okay. Yeah. Are they not and the so deepest? That's really valuable fish. Are they and, not and fish in food? Are they not the deepest dwellers in their in their environment? That's um, like over in uh, Superior, there's Cisco, right? Yeah. Which which are a form of um, lake trout that live really deep. Okay. And uh-huh. then the other lake trout kind of live further up high, and the ones that live way down deep are are narrower, long, take longer to to grow. They look quite different. Right. Um, but whitefish isn't traditionally a deep water fish. Oh, white, white fish. Yeah. I think it goes all depths. Okay. All right. It cruises around where it's, it's a planktivore. So it eats, uh, it eats zooplankton and it also eats, um, um, insect larvae that are on the bottom of the, of the lake. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how it, it gets around. It doesn't really eat other fish. I don't believe unless it eats larval fish. Um, which are, you know, baby ones. That's interesting because we, we ice fish uh, for white fish and we'll use little jigging spoons, which imitate a minnow. Yeah. We use the little Meigs jigs, which yep. look kind of like a, fi- a fish or all that. And it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah maybe, they, maybe they do. Well, when you cut them open, do you see little minnows in their guts? You know what? I've never kept too many. I've only kept a couple in my I've, life. I don't think I've Dean, ever have kept you, uh, I've never looked. Yeah. yeah no. I've never, never, never yeah. looked. It's a good question. That's the first thing I do when I catch a fish. Find out yeah, what it's eating. Yeah, that's, that would be Which smart. Absolutely. That would be smart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, other, than my, other than my sucker. <laughs> <laughs> so this seems to be a period um, where historically um, we look at it and say it's never, well, since we've been recording, I believe in 1973, the, uh, the amount of ice that the Great Lakes have been able to amass, this seems to be almost the highest um, or lowest, lowest, depending yeah. on how you're looking at lowest it, but, totally, yeah. um, that we've ever seen. Is there a concern now that we've gotten here? Is there a concern moving forward? Yeah, yeah, there is definitely. Um, because we know that climate change is, is occurring globally. Um, and to go back to the ice age that I talked to about you folks about earlier, mm-hmm. um, geologically speaking, we're currently coming out of an ice age. So, technically, we are still in 
an ice age. And if you want evidence of that, you know, look on Google Earth, look at Greenland, look at Baffin Island, Ellesmere, look at Antarctica. There's ice. Okay. Yeah. There's times on the earth where, where those ice caps weren't there because it was so warm. Yeah. And so the earth goes back and forth between having ice and losing ice. And we're in the point now where we're losing ice, except we're losing it really fast. We're losing it faster than ever seen before because the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up right. faster than we've ever known before. Wow. And so, yeah. oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's not news guys. Yeah. 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 It's scary. Wow. Well, it's, it's scary in the, the same sense, you know, that's, it's, you know, time to, you know, talk with people when you're out fishing yep. about the importance of the environment and, and what our responsibilities are towards it. Yeah. True. Um, yeah. Good point. And, and pe- people adapt, you know, people will adapt. Um, but how well they adapt depends on how fast they can adapt. When you say fast, when you say fast, I mean, we're not talking fast to the point where we could lose the polar caps, you know, in the next 20, 30 years, are we? I don't know. I've heard someone say that um, in Sault Ste. Marie, we're going to lose maple trees in 50 years. Lose no maple way. trees. No way. Lose maple trees, but it will get too warm for maple trees. Eight. You don't get maple trees in Virginia. Right. Wow. Mm-hmm. Southern right. Ontario, you know, be even warmer. Good. So it is, yeah. It is. yeah, it's something that uh, that we can see within a generation. We can see yeah. these changes within a generation, not yeah. not. Exactly. That. So, Angelo, you, you remember the seventies? Of course. I, well, yeah. they were a little spotty. Yeah, he at doesn't times, remember but, a lot of them, Mike. But, okay, but, the, uh, but, but one day a week he remembers. <laughs> Definitely not the weekends. Uh, and and okay. <laughs> all, right, all right, gentlemen. And so, um, and so, you you remember pollution like a lot oh. more than now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. for sure. Trucks burning, you know, leaded gasoline. You know, pipes dumping into lakes, foamy stuff occurring. It's normal. A lot of that's changed. Yeah. yeah. And the lakes changed. The water's changed. And 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 Pete, you've probably been to a lake and then go to a lake, the same lake, you know, a few years later and say, oh, that's different. Mm-hmm. Right? For Maybe sure. For better, for worse. Yeah. Um, so, you know, change occurs. Um, and it can change fast. It can change for the better. Um, and it could change for the worse. So we just have to be aware. That's uh, yeah. interesting. I mean, ever, so you, 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 you go back to the 70s. I mean, we used to, I can never, I, and I think of it probably more often than I should, but the way we had a total disregard for, for this planet back in the 70s and 80s, I mean, it was nothing to roll down your windows and throw your, yeah. your trash out the car yeah. while you were driving around. You yeah. Just finish eating something and you just throw it out, yeah. the paper so and the garbage out the window. I was... It was horrific when you think about it. Uh, certainly, you know, when you think about it by today's standards. But back then, we didn't know. We thought it was fine. I, so, you know, no yeah, thought. I grew up in a pulp and paper mill town in northern Ontario. And by nice, the time nice I smell in the time, air. <laughs> a nice little yeah, stench yeah. in the air. It smelled like money. Yeah, yeah. But by the time I got into high school, they actually cleaned it up. You know, we saw the changes. Good. And, you know, we, we clicked into it because we were connected to the river. And so we would right. go down there. And we would we would catch pickerel out of season when they were spawning right under the dam by the mill because <laughs> no one went there because it used to be polluted, right? right? Right. But once they started cleaning up the river, that's when the MNR started coming down and telling us to get lost. Yeah, good, <laughs> no good for them. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, Michael, have you ever? I mean, let's say in the last fifty years, has Lake Superior ever froze over completely? Oh, I wouldn't say completely, completely. Um, because there's so much energy and how it moves, you'll get you'll get leads breaking open. Right. Okay. Um, but there have been times when it's frozen pretty hard. Um, I think 2015. If you go back to 2015, that was a year that had a tremendous ice cover across the Great Lakes, um, including Ontario. I remember flying over Ontario from from Ottawa to Toronto, um, and it looked pretty. The, the middle was open, and that was not too long ago. Mm. Um, and I recall when I did my PhD in Quebec that, uh, uh, Lake Ontario had frozen over and that would have been like 
1994 or something around there. Right. Right. So it yeah. can happen. It probably won't happen now. Nowadays Not with the all the warming, but, but it has happened well, in the past. Well, the, the thing is you get fluctuations, right? Right. Yeah. And this, yeah. this is one of those El Nino years. Right. And that's what they're saying is causing a lot of this. And they're right. But then there's severity of it can change. Right. Um, you know, you've probably heard the polar vortex and the severity of it is kind of what we're experiencing right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, although, you know, minus 20 is no big deal. Right. Um, but it's pushed further south. And so there's, you know, there's there's always that natural sort of range of of stuff that's happening. But what happens is when you're talking about ice cover, you look at the record and you look at the frequency of ice, low ice years, and they're increasing and now we're seeing even greater extent of it. Right. Yep. Yeah. There's a yep. good record, a good record on Lake Champlain about that, showing that they're they're losing their ice cover. Hmm. Uh, is there? Do you foresee? Can we recover from this? Or or is this? You mentioned earlier on that it's kind of cyclical, right? And we're going through it, and we're at this yep. point, and now. Uh, oh, can yeah. You, those. Could Sorry, those, those those cycles of, of ice ages are like 30 to 50,000 to 100,000 years. So are we just part of that cycle right now? Is Or, or yeah. we are. We're just, is, it, I we're, guess what we're, I, I'm we're, asking We're part you. of the cycle, except we're affecting the rate at which we're coming out of the ah, ice age. So mm. it's the speed that we're affecting. We cannot stop it from happening, but we're making it happen faster than, than yeah. nature. Yeah, it's like when, you know, it's it's momentum, right? You got, you know, something really big and massive is moving towards you. You better get out of the way because it's going to roll right over you. You can you can get a bunch of people to try to stop it, but it's not going to happen until it slows down by itself. Right. And then maybe start rolling back the other way, you know. Um, but in the meantime, we have to make sure we're not exacerbating the situation because there's a thing called a tipping point. Um, people have talked about Venus, you know, tipping point. It just becomes like just a hot globe. Um, we don't want the earth obviously to be like that. Cause what happens when it gets really, really warm is that the abundant water that's on earth will actually get into the atmosphere and that makes water vapor and water vapor holds heat. And then, so that's called a runaway greenhouse effect. Wow. Um, wow. Oh. Just to dampen your day. Yeah, yeah you. there you go. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. <sir. laughs> well, I mean, you know, yeah. seriously, these, these are these are facts. Right? It's funny. Yeah. I was uh, <laughs> traveling with a very good friend of mine last week, and uh, we had probably way too much time on our hands. But at one point, we were philosophizing, you know, looking into the future and and what ifs and all that, and we came up with the conclusion that here in Canada, we seem to be pretty anal about all of this, to be very frank with you. You know, we're, we seem to be talking about it all the time. We now have uh, measures, measurements in, in place to, to curb it. Uh, we, and I, I know what it was. I know what it was that prompted all this. So we're down there and we go to a Walgreens to get some bare essentials, some groceries for the, for the house that we rented. And we go in and we do a little bit of shopping and we bring it up to the, uh, counter and uh the lady was very nice and she starts you know punching it in and putting it in bags and she and at one time she said would you like that double bag sir and these are plastic bags and we're looking at each other like oh my god like this is weird now because we we haven't seen plastic bags and i don't know how long but she was encouraging us to take an extra one for each one because of the weight of the goods that we're putting in those bags and then after we walked out, we said, you know, here we are busting our backs trying to get this thing figured out. And we're south of the border and like bags are a dime a dozen. How many do you want? Take them home with yeah, you. Give yeah, them to the kids. Where you are. But you know, <laughs> Give them to the kids. It's good observation. Because, because what you just mentioned is that how quickly people can adapt. Because right. to you, it's nothing now to you to bring your own bag. That's right. right. That's right. right. It's normal. It's right. pretty simple stuff, right? Yeah. So here we um, are, south of the border. Three hundred and sixty <laughs> million people are using bags, plastic bags, every day, and and our little thirty million or forty million are are struggling along without it. And 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 like I, it didn't make any sense to us. We looked at it and said, well, okay. Well, you can't blame Canada then, can you? 
Well, I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. You tell me what does like is it is it wrong for us to think that we might be able to do something about this when we've got our neighbors to the south that are totally oblivious to Well, Angelo, and, Angelo that's and Pete, this is this is where leadership comes to play. Yeah. You know, we have to show by example. We can we can do things a certain way. We can educate other people about proper ways of having you know, responsible relationships with the natural environment. Um, it's it's not a, it's not impossible, and you know maybe we are so anal about our environment because that's how we identify as Canadians. Right. You know, we like the yeah, great yeah. white north. Hell we yeah. like to be able to go out and do these things. Mm-hmm. You know, hockey identifies us. Yeah. Um, and and I love seeing immigrants gravitate to hockey as well. Oh sure. You know, it's, it's right on. Yeah. You know, because yeah. that's that's. That's so, Canada. So we are. So, yeah. Yeah. So we are. But my the, the question we kept asking each other was, you know, are, can we even make a difference? So, so here we are doing all the right things. The women down at these, uh, uh, the woman that was bagging our things, she was kind of curious because we were like so excited, like we were like little kids giggling and so, and she she asked us what 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 what's going. On? So <laughs> I ex- plastic bags. I explained to her what's going on up <laughs> oh here in Canada, God. and it was like I just tried to explain to her you know how to split an atom wow because she couldn't understand so why aren't you using them yeah well because you know we're trying to protect the environment but the like the bags hurting your environment up there wow you guys got problems she said <laughs> she says you guys got some so so when we were finished with her she honestly thought canada is in, in, is in big <laughs> trouble because Ooh. they've got some ecological problems that we have don't have down here because look we're still using all this stuff we, that's we share a lot of them we share the great lakes right yeah 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 michael can, right can, to the middle. can yeah. science can can you and your scientists can you guys help if we're getting in trouble with this lack of ice thing is there anything that science can do to help alleviate the bad outcomes let's say well i i, I thought that for the past 40 minutes i was kind of trying to do that right <laughs> Right. Um, and, and what it is, is, is speaking with people who I don't usually get to speak with. Right. Perfect. Right. Yep. Um, and so that's, that's, that's part of my role and part of my responsibility as an educator. Um, and so that's, that's where scientists has to be. Um, you know, a lot of times some scientists you know, can't talk to people because they talk a different language. Yep. Right. Um, but what we're learning more and more, about is that we have to really make an effort to um, interact with the public. They call it outreach, you know, mm-hmm. and it really makes sense too, because, you know, when we, we get grants, most of our funding for research comes from who? The public. Right. Right. Taxes. Right. And so we have an obligation to make sure that uh, people know how your money's being spent. Right. And, and why and all that. So, yeah. It's uh, the, that's that's where we are with, with with science. You know, it's that, um, and there's also citizen scientists too. You know, right? Um, there's a thing called the Rink Watch, which started in Southern Ontario, I believe, where these people who have rinks they talk about you know when their rink goes in, and then when their rink goes out, in their backyard rink. Right, right. And so all that information goes gets posted on a website, and they they've actually shown that the the time for having rinks in your backyard southern ontario is shrinking right shrinking. Yeah. and yeah so it's and that's going to affect hockey yeah. right hey. somewhere yeah. down the line that will have a profound effect sure it will on on kids on gravitating kids to that hockey. are learning in the backyard and, yeah. and creating think, skills think about that think about that think that's, about right. that. think that's, about right. that. that's another uh, i mean we wow don't, we don't. well if you ever need to reach out to us michael you know if we're fishing wise fish talk you know we can we might be able to help you a little bit we're not scientists but we're uh, we're on the water quite like a bit so so <laughs> We'll do all right at it. Anyways, uh, we've kept you far longer than uh, than we had agreed to, and and we appreciate this so much. Um, I do too. We will we will continue to reach out to you as well, and um, get you back on the program and and share with us what you're working on. I think it's so important. We we tell this to uh, M and R all the time uh, that they do a great job the, at um, implementing programs but they do a really crappy job at talking to people who have to 
adhere to those programs, uh, right? It's yeah. just awful. Their communication to people is just awful. And, and so I understand the comment you just made, right? It's important for the scientific community to speak to people um, about what they're doing, about what you're doing, what you're observing, what you're, what you're, you're, you're forecasting. Um, very important. So yep. yeah. um, we will uh, continue reaching out to you if you don't mind and, and, uh, and asking you to share it all with us. Uh, how can okay. folks get uh, in touch with you? Can somebody reach out to you and get more information about what's going on? Yes, um, you can contact me through email. My email address is michael.twist, T-W-I-S-S, at algomau.ca. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, we now will tell Carol Caputo, who is the queen of Northern Ontario tourism, that we met another local. We met a principal local. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm go. looking forward to meeting you. All right. Th thank, thank, you thank you, Michael. Thank you for the opportunity. Take, Take care and enjoy your day. You. Thank you. See you, Mike. Wow. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. interesting it's, stuff it's for very sure. Technical, but it's yeah, very yeah. interesting and it affects so us. So, right? are we any closer to understanding this food chain business? No, and, for sure we're not. But I think we've just, uh, I've just, it's opened my eyes as to the effect of this lack of ice. I have no idea. You don't, you don't think that way. I don't think that way. Having the waves no. crushing on the, on the shoreline that's not, you know, frozen anymore and it's ruining the, the sediment is uplifting and wreaking havoc versus the, the ice being there. It's just that little thing alone. It's like, You wow. see, to me, it was all about the photosynthesis, but from the sounds of it, the wind plays a, a major role in mm -hmm. when there's no ice. I was going right? to, I was going to ask him too a, about the photosynthesis role. of shooting through like we talked in our last podcast about shooting through a foot and a half of snow two feet of right. snow three feet of ice how right. does photosynthesis still work you know what i mean right. but lots to be the gives learned us still. something to work on yep. next time but yeah uh, just in closing this this i forgot to tell you last week about this this bag in bag the grocery lady. store <laughs> That's there's crazy. bags everywhere like you can get and yeah. they have different types and colors and sizes you could say and give me one of those they put that put the like yeah. the bags for yeah well, it's, you know, it's what? like it's not even happening. It's, uh, uh, Canada, maybe they're they're very advanced at that. Maybe what Michael is saying. Maybe we are, you know, we are looking at it uh, more responsibly than anybody else so far. And they will learn through it, or they will ignore it, or will be proved that ah, it doesn't matter. But it does have to matter. A good God, I mean, plastic uh, waste, it's got to matter, right? Somehow or other. So. I think we're extreme in some sun senses, but uh, I think this one maybe we got the U.S. on that right now. All right, get the upper hand on them. We have uh, a food for thought, if nothing else, uh, about this situation. Um, That's a bunch of bullshit. Well, there is that too. I didn't want to go <laughs> oh, there. That beautiful talk, and Dean just pounced I, it. I didn't want to go there, uh, but uh, we must, as we do each and every week. That's awesome. I uh, want to remind folks the contest at fishingcanada.com is ongoing i'm not sure what's there now all i know is that there are multiple contests happening as we speak people are winning garmin products coleman products Ooh, they're winning like uh, trips to to uh, far lodges. away resorts and beautiful. lodges and beautiful there uh, what i one thing i do know one thing i know for sure is that the people who are aware of it and are entering the contest are getting an opportunity to win, whereas the people who are oblivious to the contest even being up there are not going to win a thing. That's a good point. Right? Yeah. It's like released fish versus non-released fish. No the chance. ones that go in the frying pan will be dead. Gandhi. The others, hey, somebody's going to win. Somebody's right. going to win this stuff, right? That's right. So there you go. Good All point. happening at fishingcanada.com, the gateway, the, the portal to your next fishing adventure. On behalf of the uh, entire crew, uh, Mr. Peter Bowman here today in his beautiful Fishing Canada. By the way. Shop.fishingcanada.com. Uh, I was going to say, just tell them where you got that beauty. I just did. And me too for that Not matter. bad, eh? Yeah. Not bad. It's all happening right now. Um, Vova, behind the camera today, you were right on today with your camera <laughs> movement and stuff. I was particularly impressed. <laughs> I kept ah, an eye on you. Vova, uh, today you was can, special. I think Vova, I need, uh, we need to mic up Vova in these special situations where he so can too. just throw one right back. Oh, that'd be the best. Oh, today. my God. <laughs> uh, Nick, I see Nick is uh, where he normally would be. And, uh, of course, Dean Taylor. Come on now. Thank you to everybody. We will catch you next time. Take care.